order our public safety committee meeting. Uh, let's see, can I get a motion to approve our October 2nd minutes? So moved. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 And those opposed? Hearing none, okay, motion carries. Uh, we do have written reports in here. The uh, final uh, Integris architecture progress report, strategic initiatives monthly update, our uniform overtime report, sit lie monthly updates, photo red for October 2023, and our quarter three forfeiture report. So for anybody watching who would like to dig into those, you can find them attached to the agenda. Uh, we'll start off with our fire update. Uh, and I know uh, Tom Williams is uh, not here. And so I think we have Deputy Chief Julie Oberg. Come on up. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you. Uh, so yearly trends year to date 2023 uh, we're actually holding pretty steady from what we were in 2022 there's no statistical significance increase or decrease right now we are at 44,139 dispatched incidents um, of a little bit of note I think I think you might have these stats in report that need a little bit of uh, explanation our EMS calls, uh, the what we call life-threatening EMS calls, show a 48% increase, while our non-life-threatening show a 31% decrease. That's really simply, uh, it balances out, and it's really based on uh, dispatch triage and the way that the dispatches are questioned and then what our units are sent out the door initially. But the overall call and what we're finding upon arrival really has no statistical significance from 2022. Uh, fire incidents, working fires, um, actually show a 30% decrease. However, our total dispatched fires show a 10% increase. So we're dispatched on a fire. When the crews actually get there, they make it a working fire. Those are increased, but the overall number of dispatched working fires is, is, is only about a 10% change. Overall, um, really, this has been a pretty steady year uh, from what 2022 is, which is, is welcome. That's, we haven't seen that in a couple of years, so we, we're, we're happy with where the trends are showing. Any questions? Go ahead. Did those uh, numbers change significantly at all as we merged with Shrek, the way that they were dispatched? Did any of that change? So, um, great point, and I think, I, uh, honestly, that's a number I want to dig into a little bit more. Um, there's some anecdotal that I, the, the answer is yes, and some that I'd like to more dig into statistically to see. Um, the same triage uh, procedures are used. I think the application uh, between one organization to the other, uh, my, my opinion is that the application has been a little bit different. So I think we've had some, some growing and learning curves uh, based on that. Do you see that um, ever returning back to where when it was just fire dispatch with the city as opposed to with Shrek, do you see those numbers coming more into alignment with time? Um, I, I think we'll see, a, 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 I think we'll definitely see a decrease of that curve will we ever get exactly where we're at? I don't think so. And, and I'll be honest, my professional opinion is I don't think we should. Um, our, the, the protocol that we advise is it's conservative for a reason. Um, we want to send, we want to oversend, if you will, within, uh, within realm of reason. Uh, and we were probably holding on calls a little bit longer to try to right size it. That's honestly a discussion that's going across the country as far as trying to separate out how we measure uh, emergency responses versus how we measure non-emergency. And fire departments across the country are faced with more and more of the non-emergency, but yet really all of our protocol only allows us to address that in an emergency fashion. So it's, it's really gonna be a professional wide um, thing that we're gonna have mm -hmm. to address. Would you, um, in the next update, would this be a topic that we discuss just to see if, again, things are starting, starting to level Absolutely. off or if it continues to be? Absolutely. Yeah, we can you. dig into that and get, get a few more details. And Any on that note, I would love to, to see if we can um, pull it together in a report, just kind of what the average uh, duration of calls are and then also uh, like the number of resources that we're deploying per call. I think that'd be helpful to just kind of that's an easy number. Yeah. I don't have it today, but that, I, can put my, I can put my finger on that one very easily. We, Perfect. We, yeah, we've got that's an easy number. That'd be great. Um, and actually, in the report, that it, if, did you guys get these stats in, the, in your, re, your packet? I believe so. So on the last page. I just circulated. Okay. Okay. On the last page, all of our units are listed, and the very far right column is something that's called UHU. 
and that's unit hour utilization. And so it shows, uh, it, it basically, if, if, if one unit was busy 100% of the time on a shift, so 24 hours with nothing else other than calls, that number would be 1.0. All of our UHUs are well within reason. Um, I look at those as flashing lights, and there's numbers where it's like, oh, that's a yellow light, that's a very busy unit that we either need to start looking at getting another unit there or somehow okay. address what they're dispatched. None of those, uh, our, our ARUs are probably the closest to being that busy uh, other than engine 18, uh, but none of those are really in the flashing red light area yet. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, anything else? Yeah. Okay. I had a question. Well, first that you were talking about that. Um, the UHU, what is uh, the good range, I guess? Um, so we consider 0.3 is a busy unit. Mm -hmm. So we really want a third of their time on calls. Um, we want a third of their time, you know, working on their own nutrition, their own training. A third of that time needs to be down. And the reason that that sounds low, but if you have a unit that is busy 100% of the time, it means they're missing calls. Yeah. Okay. And then I had a question that I don't know if you could answer or not, but it was about Shrek. Um, and I, I was wondering, it's been about a year since we transitioned to Shrek. I just was curious what our cost savings ended up being because we talked about what it could be. And I, I don't know if you yeah, have that or not. Um, and I apologize. I'm not going to have the um, answer to that. So if I can right. turf that to Chief Schaefer right. or Williams, I will. All right, that'd be helpful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yep. It's a quick, good, quick, good question. Another quick question. I had an opportunity to meet with your CARES team. Are there any plans to change how you use CARES in the future? So great question. I don't know that I'm the exact one to answer that. I, I, I will tell you my professional opinion, we should be expanding that program. I mean, that, that is what we need. And, and um, we definitely look for ways for both the BRU and CARES. How do we get them even busier, even more calls? Because I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of times that we could utilize them that we just haven't, haven't quite yet grasped on how to make sure that we're connecting them in the right spot. So it's, yeah. it's definitely on the list. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. All right, next up, uh, Chief Meidel. Good afternoon, Chairman, Cathcart, members of the council. So we were asked at our advanced agenda setting committee to talk on three topics. Uh, one was an update on our behavioral health unit, the co-deployed unit. Uh, one was property one enforcement. Uh, if that passes, what does that look like? And then crime trends. I will let Captain Bull start with the behavioral health unit update and then cover the other two. Thank you, Chief. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, so with BHU, we just recently signed a two-year contract. So it's a new, it's the first time that we've done two years versus one. So our new contract is good through June of 2025. So signed contract, funding coming in. Right now we've got two Spokane County Sheriff's deputies assigned to the unit, four from Spokane PD. Two are on light duty currently, but we're getting them back. So at full capacity, we'll have six members along with a supervisor and a uh, triage person who oversees um, all the, the calls and follow up with the hospitals. Um, what we're doing now um, is we've worked with Frontier, uh, Frontier Behavioral Health to kind of streamline a hiring process for their clinicians. So we're gonna uh, be able to do backgrounds and work with them to make sure their candidates meet our requirements to ride with our officers and be out there with, uh, with the law enforcement as they do their jobs. Um, that is in collaboration with them. So that's been a real positive uh, piece working with Frontier. Um, the, the challenges that we're facing right now in behavioral health is just the uh, amount of people that, pe that the clients are seeing out at Eastern State. So year to date, they've had five long-term uh, clients receive help at, a, at, at uh, Eastern, which is challenging because these are the, the individuals who are causing crimes and, and violent crimes, and unfortunately, they're being deemed in, in, you know, incapable of committing those crimes through a 1077 program through their defense. And so what that does is we continue to, to work these crimes and our major crimes comes out, and a lot of the times these people are going before the judge and they're saying they're not able to, to stand trial. So that's a challenging for our folks, both uh, patrol as well as investigation. So that's one of our challenges right now. Uh, another one is when it's misdemeanor crimes. They're supposed to come out within 30 days and, and make an evaluation on those clients. Um, they, that, that can't happen with their staffing. They can't do that. So those are being dismissed because they don't do it within those 30 days uh, for a misdemeanor crime. So that's another challenge we're facing um, at the patrol level. 
Uh, the last little bit of challenge that we're facing is right now our emergency rooms are just inundated. 30% of the, the clients up at the hospitals are um, both mental health uh, uh, folks who are needing mental health help and or drug use. And so they're, they're overwhelmed. So that's for us, we're sending officers up there or our clinicians up there, behavioral health, and they're spending an exorbitant amount of time because they're so overworked up there. So those are the challenges. The positives are we've got, we'll, we'll be at full staffed with six. We did get that contract. We're gonna continue to work, um, attend trainings and, and kind of grow that behavioral health to where we are, um, uh, Top, you know, top line in the state for, for what we're doing. People come to us for, for questions, which is good. And I know like council member Ulrich, you had reached out to us, do you want to meet with us, to kind of talk about some things with Cahoots. So we love that we're getting some interest and we're able to, to talk with people. So that's kind of the update on behavioral health right now. Any questions for the captain? Uh, let's go ahead. So what is the scheduling like with the behavioral health? Is that a 24 seven schedule or when do they be with you, the behavioral health team? The team, so they're, they're um, it's not a 24 hour, it's, it's uh, most of the time during the day, the, the daytime hours. The clinicians, when we go out, they're with us 24, I mean, they're with us all the time though. So when we go to response to calls or to the emphasis areas in Spokane, we take our clinicians, they're right there with us. Yeah, um, I, my question is, people are in the hospital, what happens then? Are they being treated or are they just being let go? So um, a lot of times they're overstaffed or overworked, and so they, they let them go. They, they may have a, a brief contact with them, and they release them. And we've seen it to where, unfortunately, those, those folks have taken their own lives afterwards um, or have gone out and committed crimes. And so we are seeing that. They're seeing that. Um, the, the answer, we don't know what the answer is for, for the medical piece. But to answer your question, they do see them. But most of the time, they don't have the capacity to keep them or transfer them, like I said, out to Eastern State or to get that um, help that they need. And so they will release them. And then it's just kind of that continual cycle. But did I hear you say that Eastern is, it's not full? It is not, no. So why, why is that a problem to release them there to Eastern? That, that, that's outside of our purview. I don't know why they choose not to keep them there at those times or assign them to Eastern State. Um, that's not a law enforcement thing. That, that's a a mental health board that is making that decision. Okay, Sorry. So, so interestingly, I just spoke with Eastern State and they are full. They are receiving overflow out of the Seattle area. Okay. So those where those beds are going and there are not beds for our people here because they're being shipped over here because they had a closure over on the other side of the state. So there is no capacity. That is irresponsible of the state. Go ahead. I've worked a few crisis lines in the past, and I know that often the bulk of the mental health calls come in evening, late at night. Is there any consideration when we think about scheduling, if you're scheduling the teams to just operate during the day? Uh, it, it, do you have any data around the, when the bulk of your mental health calls are coming in? We actually do have some in the evenings, and we do have True Blood that rides with our patrol as well in the evening. So we do have, have officers out there, and we do have our department, which is CIT trained. Um, we do have people that are actually responding to those. As far as the BHU, those are more um, morning and evening hours, not the late night. True Blood and officers work those evening shifts, and they're the ones who respond to those type of calls. Um, in, a, in a perfect world, I would have you know 20 more behavioral health unit clinicians working with our folks, and we would have it 24/7. And that's a that's with, with staffing and bodies that would be perfect. Okay. Anything else for the captain? Yep. Um, on your uh, the behavioral health unit contract, um, two years. It seems like we hear a lot with staffing contracts that you know they need to be longer in length for people maybe not wanting to know if their position is gonna be gone in a couple of years. Is two years long enough for that contract? Uh, Steve Wool, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think the longer we go, that the, I think that the more you can secure, somebody's gonna feel secure in their job. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be something that down the road we've pushed for of looking at, is that something that we can potentially hire um, through the city? So that way we could say, okay, it's a city job working with our department, we can screen them appropriately, and then it's, a, it's something that they have until they either um, step away later down the road or choose not to do that. It's not, I hope that grant gets renewed. And so me personally, I would love to see at least five years because then we know we're gonna have those bodies willing to work with us and they feel secure in taking that job, moving from another area or another area in, in mental health to come work with us. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I guess we can have a longer discussion about that. Um, um, 
with with respect to the folks that are deemed not able to stand trial, um, I'm assuming that again this isn't a Washington problem. Are there other states that are finding ways to uh, both keep the balance of people who can't stand trial, but also helping folks to get the, the help that they need. Have you seen something somewhere else? And what can we do to either encourage the state to take a different position or what do we need to do? Yeah, I, I wish I could answer that. I don't have that data being so new to my position. I know we probably can get that and I will work with RBHU unit to get that information and provide that at a later time if that would work. I just don't have that data with me right now, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I had a different topic related to police. Okay. Um, and, and, and Chief still has a couple of things to update oh, yeah, us on, I too. Can wait. So. I'll wait. Okay. Chief, do you want to go ahead and... Thank you. Uh, just a couple other things. The, uh, it's a great partnership with Frontier Behavioral Health. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the demand for their service is greater than our supply of, of folks. So uh, we love the program. Our hope had been that uh, at some point when the grant money through WASPIC runs out, the state would find a way to continue funding local jurisdictions uh, through state funds. I don't know that that's going to happen, but there's definitely a great need for it for sure. Um, and just throughout as well, typically uh, every month, between 70 to 80 percent of those that are co-deploy team contacts are diverted from jail and uh, or the emergency rooms as well. So tremendous uh, relief for the jail, tremendous relief for the ERs. But as you can see, it's, it's really just the tip of the iceberg with, with what our uh, ERs are facing. OK, real quick then, because um, I know we have another question here from Council Member Zappone. Uh, property one enforcement, we've been asked several times, how are we going to enforce that? It will, those will be prioritized just like any other calls that we have coming into the police department. So if you look at 2022, the amount of calls made to the Spokane Police Department increased by 12%. So that was in 2022. Uh, the latest numbers this morning from Shauna Ernst is our calls for service year to date increased over 14% compared to 2023. So we're talking about a roughly 25% increase in calls to the Spokane Police Department. So we are, uh, again, we're a very busy police department. We're staying, staying very busy. So when it comes to uh, enforcement, if Proposition 1 passes, uh, it, will, it will go in the queue based on the priority of what other calls are holding and then what other calls are coming in. We also do have a homeless outreach team, and their job is every single day they go out and address these camping complaints. Uh, so that will go in the queue for, for many of them that will go in their queue. They will address it. If it happens by chance to be a slow day, officers on patrol may be dispatched to these types of complaints as well. Uh, but we will ha always have full-time homeless outreach team officers at, assigned to addressing those. And the rest will be based on the priority of the calls that are sitting on the screen. Okay, Chief, and then crime Chief, one, one question. Yes. So I, I wanted to get in the weeds a little bit here because... How are you going to know if a camper camping is 1,000 feet from a school, a daycare, a park? Do you have ways to measure? And, and furthermore, how do the campers know that they're 1,000 feet from all those different yeah, venues? That, that's a great question. Um, so as far as how do the campers know, I, I don't know. I don't know how they will know that. And, and how will you know? Are you going to be carrying a tape measure? I mean, how do you going to we don't have tape measures in our budget, but we can talk about that <laughs> afterwards. Um, uh, that's a good question. So we'll look at blocks. You know, how, how wide is a typical block? Um, if, if anything, I think our officers will err on the side of caution when it comes to addressing that so that we um, so that we can avoid any kind of inconsistencies. Well, were they 950 feet or were they 1,050 feet? So those are logistics we're absolutely going to have to work out. And we'll have to work with legal on that as well because we aren't going to have tape measures. So what is, legal, what is legal telling us if we issue them a citation? Here's what we're going to need in order to follow through on that. Um, my sense is we will do, for many of these, what we try to do, education initially. It's we're going to try to educate, educate, educate. Um, and really what, what our goal ultimately is, is those people that we know we've contacted repeatedly and they continue to do it. At some point, they're going to get a citation. Or if we meet someone who, who says, I'm not moving, I don't care what you do, okay, now we're going to take enforcement action. But the primary goal will be education initially, and then uh, at some point we'll transition to enforcement. But we will have to work out that, that distance piece. It's a great question. Chief, I, I imagine it wouldn't be too difficult to just simply have an overlay on our GIS that 
you know, officers could pull up on their phone and see, am I in, in the zone or not in the zone and then make the decision accordingly. Yeah. Technology is amazing. If we, if we can uh, incorporate, as you said, the G the GIS for the different schools, the different parks, the different daycares, uh, and then incorporate that into our GIS that's in our vehicles that that will help solve that piece as well. It'll take a while to get there, but that's something that we can explore. One more before you continue, could you, um, uh, uh, or, or Shauna provide a breakdown of that 25% increase based on what percentage is uh, like calls in progress versus sort of calls where the, the crime or the incident has already taken place and it's no longer an urgent. Uh, so in call. essence, like what's a cold call where there's yeah. no threat immediately, the person is gone versus what's in progress? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Okay, go ahead. On this, on this question here, I have, I have a, a question for this when it comes to the enforcement without a specific device. So um, is it, can officers write a ticket for speeding without being able to measure somebody's speed? Um, technically, yes. Okay. We don't do it. I mean, we don't, but we can, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that's going to be based on training and experience. Like I was in the traffic unit for two years. So me working speed measuring devices, LIDARs for two years, um, that gives me that training experience to say, based on my training experience, this person was going 20 miles an hour of the speed limit. We don't, we don't do it, but we can. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, then crime trends. Um, one of the questions that came up was um, specifically as it relates to, uh, and hopefully this was related to me correctly, DOAs. Is that sound accurate to anything anyone was curious in? Okay. So... Um, when you look at, I went to the medical examiner's report, uh, obviously their 2023 report will not be out and finalized until 2024. But when we're looking at Spokane County, uh, in their report, they don't break it down by city versus county. But when we look at 2022, uh, there were 6,036 deaths in Spokane County, which is a 9.8 decrease from the year prior. So let's go now. So if there's 6,036 in 2022, there were 6,695 in 2021, so about 600 and some change more deaths in 2021 than there was in uh, 2022. But then when we go back to 2020, there were 5,954 deaths in Spokane County compared to where we were in 2022 of 6,000. So it's a snapshot when we're breaking down, uh, for example, DOAs in the city of Spokane. It can be challenging because some of the DOAs will come in as, um, and fire would be an excellent resource because we don't go on every single DOA. Fire goes on a lot. If it's an overdose, fire is pretty much going to be the lead on that. Uh, we tend to go on, obviously, uh, any fatalities due to criminal, criminal methods. Suicides, we go on the majority of the suicides as well. Fire will go on a lot of the overdose, overdose deaths. So that's, that's a challenging number just within the city limits to, uh, I guess, to uh, quantify as well. Yeah. And then if we're looking at criminal trends just in general, um, I, I'm not sure if we're looking at the Comstat report year to date when we're looking at violent crime and property crime as well. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if there's any related to that. But I do want to talk about just super briefly, uh, everyone knows that Department of Justice collects nationwide crime data through the FBI. So we send our crime data, as does every jurisdiction in the state of Washington, to WASPIC, the Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. They then get that data, they scrub it to make sure it fits FBI guidelines, and then they send that to FBI. FBI will come out with their UCR crime report, uniform crime report. So one of the things that we've heard recently as, is that violent crime in the United States is uh, down when you're looking at violent crime. But I do want to point out real quickly, there's another report that doesn't seem to get as much tra traction. It's from the Bureau of Justice Statistics National Crime Victimization Survey, NCVS. Talk about Department of Justice, not only is it FBI, ATF, DEA, et cetera, et cetera, um, not only is it the UCR, but the NCVS also fall, falls under the Department of Justice. And what they do is they actually call people and they say, were you a victim of a crime? What kind of crime were you a victim of? And what their latest report showed was that 48% of all violent crime in the United States uh, was reported in 2022. So what that means is 52% of violent crimes, according to victims that they called, were not reported to law enforcement in 2022. Now that is down from 52% that were not reported in 2021. So when you're looking at violent crime being reported as measured by the Uniform 
crime report. Less than half of violent crime is, is being reported. So I only I tell you that because when we look at numbers, we have to be careful because the numbers are only one part of the equation. So I just I wanted to throw that out. It's a, again, it's the Bureau of Justice Statistics National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, less than half of violent crime in the U.S. is reported. So that's important to throw out. Can we go back to DOA? Yes. So I guess my question is, where? DOA where? Is it in somebody's house? Is it on the street? Is it in a hospital? Is it? Um, so the numbers that, that come from the uh, medical examiner's office, those are all uh, DOAs in, this, in the county of Spokane, whether it's hospital, the street, and the house. So everyone that died, regardless of where? Correct. Okay. Correct. And I, and I think maybe where that uh, DOA question came from, I um, sat in with uh, police dispatch recently and, and just anecdotally and through our conversation, it came up that typically on an average day, there might be one or two sort of DOA, but on this particular day, there was like six or seven and it was a, a significant jump. And so yeah. is there, um, I mean, if we see an anomaly like that, I mean, is there anything additional that we do proactively to see if there's something, you know, a bad batch of drugs or you know, something that's maybe creating that uh, issue? It, yeah, if we go there, uh, and that's an area where we definitely have some room for growth. There is a, um, a software program out. It's, it's funded by uh, the federal government where you basically have every time there's an over, and I'll use overdose as an example, every time there's an overdose, uh, what they basically require is the local jurisdiction to fill out a brief template which says what's the suspected drugs, uh, what was the location, and then it is mapped, uh, it's the OD map, it's mapped immediately, and then jurisdictions can look at that map and say, here's a trend in location X. So let's do some more investigation on that and determine is there a common theme and is there a, a batch of drugs that may have higher levels of fentanyl or is there something else going on? So there is software out there. Um, it, it requires both um, fire and police to collaborate on that because, again, a, a lot of these DOAs um, we don't necessarily go to. They'll just get diverted from SPD to uh, Spokane Fire. Okay. Go ahead. So th thank you again, Chief, because you said the same thing last Friday that with the Measure 1, uh, the camping, they'll just go in the queue. Uh, of course, they'll have to meet. If they're more severe, they can meet all the other requirements, but they'll go in the queue which is frustrating because citizens think they're going to get this new layer or level of uh, police response time, and it's not going to happen through no fault of your own, but it's not going to happen. So they will be right where you are in about three weeks saying we called dispatch and nobody came to see us. Also, will you be doing any type of data capturing on, on this measure one, uh, how many... Will there be the category so we know in six months that we arrested or cited or whatever uh, that might be for, for this particular instance? Um, we can. And just to clarify, if, if it is a slow day, it, officers may have more capacity to respond to these. If it's a busy day, mm -hmm. it's going to go in the queue, and, and they may not be able to make it to it. But it's just going to be based on the call load that day. And in terms of your question of will there be data that we can collect related to this, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's not just about you. Yeah. Uh, so they have to have code enforcement helping them. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the officers going out there. It's about all the other people it takes to mitigate camping. And that's why, yeah, you might be able to respond, but there m may not be enough code enforcement or outreach people to help them do what they need to do. Well, we well, said he has a list as well. So unless it's something critical, they're in the area. Yeah. Already they can go assist, yeah. but if I mean, not, they've got a two-week backlog right now. Exactly. So, and, and code doesn't go on all of these with us. They, they'll go on some. We'll we'll go on we'll go on some of these just with us. I mean, we do, for example, around the uh, the track location, we have two officers assigned to work in that area at, at random days throughout the week. So they'll go and they'll address the majority of these on their own, and they'll just say, "Hey, you can't camp here. You're along the river. You have to move on." And what they will do, though, is if this, this person is either uh, leaves a large amount of trash and refuse, they'll then refer it to code enforcement to come and clean up, uh, or if it's an abandoned camp. So some of these we do go on and handle all by ourselves. Others we do need code enforcement with us. So it's kind of a hybrid approach. Chief, one, one uh, just a, kind of an adjacent question, I guess. Uh, a big frustration I've been having for several months is we've had this... Um, spot on Lions Avenue where we've had campers and trash and um, 
it should have never happened. And unfortunately, it just keeps continuing and we can't get it cleaned up. Recently, as you know, there was a body discovered and perhaps a suspicious death and might be more. How will that affect the city's ability to now enforce and get that area cleaned up? Is that going to significantly delay because you have to collect evidence and stuff like that? Or do, do you know how that would affect long term or medium um, term? The latest incident you're talking about was, um, I don't believe it was at that outdoor location. Because the one you're talking about is outdoor, correct? Well, it's, it's a number of, of houses that are aband effectively abandoned. I mean, they're, they're owned by a developer that will eventually be developed. But Yeah. Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Well, I'm just trying to understand, you know, now that there's potentially a murder that's taken place on that property, how will that delay our ability to get it cleaned up? Yeah, um, and typically it depends on the complexity of the case, how much evidence there is to collect. But usually, uh, f for the most part, our detectives will be done with that scene within four to six hours. I will say if it's nighttime, what we're typically doing following best practices is, is we'll lock down the scene and wait till daytime to uh, finish processing the scene. I, I would say it shouldn't delay it more than a day. Oh, okay. So it's it's not going to have to sit there for a long long period of time for future evidence gathering or anything like that. Uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Oh uh, yeah, I had a question about Shrek again. So similar to Fire was asking what the savings would have been at Fire. I was wondering if there's been any analysis to look at what potential savings would be if police were to go to Shrek. Um. We do have, we actually have a fairly robust presentation on that, and it would take some time to go through and explain the different layers to that, because there's different, there's different layers between the 911 call taker, that's the person who calls 911, determines this is city, this is county, this is fire, this is law enforcement. So that's one layer of funding. And then the second layer of funding is going to be your call, I'll call them call processors. And that's if it is a crime that we need to go to, uh, or let me rephrase that. The 911 call taker takes the initial information. If they say it is city police, they push a button, it comes over to city police, and then our call processors then go on, get on the phone with the caller. What's the nature, the details, location, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a second layer, that call processor. And then the third layer is actually the dispatchers who are actually sending that out to the officers. So there's multiple layers of that. Each one has a different cost analysis with it, but we do have a pretty robust presentation that we'd be happy to present. Yeah, look, look forward to having that at a future public safety meeting. And then I've, the fourth layer of that, somewhat ancillary, is crime check as well. Those calls where we don't need to send an officer, just they need a report. So there's really about four layers to it. Okay. Anything else for the chief? Chief, anything else from you? No, thank you. Okay, thank Thanks. you. All right, uh, next up, Steve McDonald and Eric. And I think you're kind of the goal here. It's, it's a kind of 50,000 foot view. We do have a study session in a couple of weeks where we can get further into the details. And then if there's some brief questions folks have, we can try to tackle those today. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Council. Um, we're, we're not prepared for a presentation at this point because we had looked uh, based on the conversation we were having last week and the questions we got were taking another look at how we can best answer those questions and setting up meetings, et cetera. And then we do have the, um, as Councilman Cathcart mentioned, we have a November 30th study session. But um, we are open to answer questions. And first, I, we have one slide so for today. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that have met with Eric and I, you know that I really love this slide because this really shows in one picture what, what we're trying to achieve. So the green, just to remind you, the green are high poverty census tracts. These are census tracts that generally have poverty over 20% or AMI below the federal level. So that's a problem, that's the first problem. But we have a way to kind of weave together a solution here and the orange, and then the orange with the little red dots in it, which are kind of hard to see from this distance, is the city's 214 miles of conduit and then another 96 miles of active fiber. And then the three blue areas are PDAs. So you can see that our PDAs, the conduit, are all interwoven with these high poverty census tracts. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And what we want to do is take something that's taken 15 years to kind of put in the ground. Eric's been at this for a long time now and has long had the vision to take what we have in the ground and connect it for the purpose of giving digital 
internet connectivity to neighborhoods who don't have it in urban areas, which is not most of the focus of the federal dollars at this time and is not the focus of Broadlink, which is focused on rural areas. Um, but we want to be able to take what we have put in the ground in the city, having that forethought to require when the, when the streets are torn up to put in other types of infrastructure, we've been requiring that they put in conduit at the very least because it's so much easier down the road when we already have the conduit in there to pull the fiber through. And we've done this, and congratulations are due to having the forethought to do that, but now we need to take that next step. What can we do with this? And I believe it's crucial, and Eric has believed it's crucial, that if we're going to create any jobs, high, you know, high wage, living wage jobs in our three PDAs or elsewhere, there needs to be internet, high capacity internet connectivity. So this is a long-term play on that. But the proposal, which you'll hear more about at the study session, also has a neighborhood pilot project to show how we can use that same city's infrastructure to bring you know, that kind of high capacity internet to neighborhoods who don't have it now. And just a couple other things before I open it up for questions. We have been working directly with Broadlink. Um, Arian Schmidt has been a part of our weekly meetings that we've been doing for well over six months, and we've been meeting regularly for about a year mm -hmm. on this project. While they're focused on the rural areas, they don't have that advantage that we have where we have, they, they have no fiber and no conduit. We have the fiber and conduit, and we can make those connections that will help Broadlink get out to the rural areas by the edges of our city having um, you can see in the area out towards the West Plains going south and up in the northeast PDA and in the northwest, we have conduit or fiber that's going up there. So we can work together with them and find ways to uh, benefit both their, their goals and ours at the same time by kind of them playing off of what we have in the ground right now. And lastly, because um, I know it was a question that was brought to our attention last week, we had initially looked at a PDA um, format for doing this outside the city. Um, and now we had kind of thought that a 501c3 would be the right uh, entity, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, one, we think it needs to be a separate entity that has a contract or MOU with the city because this is the kind of skill set that needs to run this and to be involved in working with all the uh, providers out there that is not a typical civil service type position and one that we wouldn't have the flexibility to bring the kind of people that can really do this well. There's um, funding uh, opportunities with having a 501c3. We think that there's particular government grants that could come through because it's a 501c3, donations, et cetera. Um, and uh, just that, that flexibility, the focus, which we've never had in the 15 years, this has always been part-time people in IT that have done this work when they can, and consequently, um, as good as the people are that are spending these part-time efforts on doing this, we, we can't achieve what we need to achieve, and that's been shown for those of you that were aware of the fat beam issue when they came forward. You know, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't operate with market knowledge and market information and the speed we needed to. Um, because we don't, we don't have that focus. This is just one little part of IT that's done part-time. So we believe in order to extract the full benefit and also the full uh, investment back to the city, we need to do that as a separate entity. And lastly, just on this issue, I, I've got personal experience with seeing how well an entity like this, a, a nonprofit, could work hand in glove with a city. In my experience in Los Angeles, where I headed up Film LA. That was something that was done really poorly by the city. You had different counters set up, public works, transportation, building and safety, and people were trying to get film permits that employed a lot of people in that region. And so we made it a, a nonprofit entity that had a contract with the city, and we could do that more cheaply, more efficiently. Um, we had a lot more flexibility about who we could hire, about hours that people were working. Filming happens all night sometimes. We had people out on the streets. You know, helping with that. So there, there are examples that I've been involved in that just worked out great. And we have some local examples of things like the PFD and STA that used to be a part of the city, but they need that focus to be able to do it um, directly. So that, that, that's the reason um, we feel strongly about that. 
Steve, I, yes. I just want to uh, thank you for all the work and effort that yeah. you put into this because I think it really does create a, a great opportunity uh, not only to, to expand access, which is a big deal, but also to create a revenue stream that right. would really, I think, bolster the city and, and allow us to do quite a few things. Yeah. Um, but what really excites me more than anything is, and I don't think you mentioned the neighborhood, but the Logan pilot yeah. that we're looking at, because I think it will be, um, I, I think it will establish something that can work citywide, um, but we have to, to pilot this and demonstrate that and show how this could work. And so... I know there's a lot of conversations around how you know some of this would be funded and all of that, and we'll obviously get a bigger presentation on the 30th. Um, but I think this is something yeah. that could do wonders for the city. Yeah, so. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So, Steve, when we started this project over a year ago, uh, when we hired the consultant, it was to map where our conduit was at because we had no knowledge of where it was all, where the gaps were. So that mapping has been completed. And so were there gaps that need to be filled for us to provide better service? Because I don't think I've really heard yeah. specifically where those gaps are. Yeah, and that'll be a part of our presentation. Okay. But yes, there are gaps. And there's, I mean, there's more gaps than we're coming forward now for any type of funding, whether it be ARPA or elsewhere. Okay. There's many more gaps than there is, you know, the funding we're asking for. But we're talking about three distinct um, infrastructure projects mm -hmm. and then the pilot project to initially get started. Okay. That's that's what the funding uh, request is okay. for. Just so we know where the gaps are within the inner core. That's yeah. Okay. And, and, yep. I, and I would just add to that because it, it's a great question. Part of what we've been doing over the past 10, 15 years is opportunistic and it's been conduit. What what this initial funding that we're trying to look to to, to get aligned helps make sure we're running you know fiber through each of those you know, conduits. We have fiber in some places, but a lot of the gaps is just where we have conduit but not fiber. But this gets it out in the neighborhoods. It gets it out, you know, I mean, as we run to each of the PDAs, guess what? We're hitting all those census tracts as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you both. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm going to skip around just a little bit real quick. Um, can we get uh, Major Olson for 4.6, the SBOs? And then, uh, Julie, are you covering 4.8? Okay, you'll be next. Good afternoon, council members, council president. Uh, I have several in front of me, so if I'll start with the JAG one for 22 and 23, if those are the ones you're referring to. We are asking uh, to use the JAG money from both uh, JAG 22 and 23 and authority to do so through SBOs. It comes to just over $200,000 out of the two. The first one will be used for ballistic door panels for to make our vehicles more safe for our officers out there. The JAG-23 money would be used to procure gas mask and hopefully to buy a patrol vehicle as well. Any questions? Yes. Did you say gas masks? Gas masks, yes. For for all, all of our officers do not have individually assigned gas masks. Oh. So we're trying to get them. They have to be individually fit. So we are looking to use this funding to get a gas mask for every member of our department at the rank of sergeant and below. And that would be something they would carry for if they're deploying gas that they would put on? Correct. Okay. Or if they're, even if they're in an environment where powder, we've, our SWAT team has encountered powdered fentanyl in the air during search warrants. And obviously that prevents provides a huge oh, risk yeah. factor. So these give them a level of protection that they would otherwise not have. Okay. Any other questions? Good question. Yeah, I had a question on the door panels. Does that um, get in every patrol vehicle? Oh, no. That, that would get us down the road of starting to get into patrol vehicles. It's, they're, they're not exactly cheap, and so we're mm -hmm. going to start chipping away at them as we can, and as we have budget to do, we would like to get them in our doors. So any idea how many it would be? Uh, I don't know how much of this funding. I believe they're around three grand per car. It's about 40. 40. It, this is enough for about 40 cars. All right, and then I guess my question is, after our cars are, hit their maximum miles, do we take the doors off and put them on new doors? or do We have off? actually, in the <laughs> recently, CJTC sent us some training cars. I believe you saw something that came through allowing us to use that, have that agreement with them. Their cars that came from the training commission had the panels in the doors. But because they're training cars, we wrote a letter and said, can we take them and put them in our old car? So, yeah, they can be moved from one car to the next as long as the life of the shield, the actual panel is still valid. Hmm. Okay. Go ahead. What is the life of one of those panels? Is it just so, until it's 
hit? So, or? no, like the ones we wear, they're a five year, five year panels for the ones that our officers wear on the street and then they have to be replaced. That's under the manufacturer's warranty and what they rate them for protection. The door panels, I don't know because they're not subjected to, they still have the hot and cold obviously, but they don't get the sweat factors that our personal uniforms would, would have to endure. So I'm not sure what they're, for their length. Well, and that's what I'm curious, forgive my ignorance here, how would they go bad? Well, that's, that's one of those curious questions. The manufacturers of those panels, they say they're good for this long, this is how long we'll warranty them, and then we, they don't warranty them anymore. So we take them at their word because I don't want to be the person that says, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll trust them anyway. Fair enough. Very good. Okay. Anything else? There are several oh. others under consent. If you're good with those, then I will move along and yep. let you have the next one. Yeah, I think just cover the, the JAG ones and we're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, Julie? And then Clint, you'll be next up. And I, I say I'm prepared, but I apologize. I just got notified shortly before the meeting that I'd be doing this, so oh. I think I've got the right numbers. So the SBO is for the uh, incident management team mobilizations for the wildland season. We're not complete with that. Um, right now, I believe the SBO request is 586,000. Um, that that's what we, we have already coming in for reimbursements. We're expecting that to be probably closer to 600,000 by year end when we have all the paperwork through. Okay. And, and that goes directly back to fire or does that go in the general fund? I think that question was asked once we before. Where does so, that money go? So what that should cover, because the bulk of that is for overtime, so that should go back in to cover the fire overtime for the backfill. Okay. I guess the question does become pertinent, though, because if it goes back into the general fund, does 8% of that have to go to parks or something like that? So when it's reimbursed, does it go directly back to fire? Apologies, Council Member Bingle. I don't ha okay. I, I think I understand how it goes, but I don't want to okay. answer that for sure just in case I am off. We'll have to ask Tanya. Okay. I, I know the changes that we did two years ago were to try to cover some of the issues with our overtime and where, where we didn't separate out MOBs, um, knowing that those came in for reimbursement. But I, I will certainly ask Chief yeah. Williams or Chief Schaefer to make sure they get a, an accurate answer to you on that. Thank you. Did I, the DOE grant, do we need to, any, anything need addressed on that one? Um, it's on our consent, so I think we're okay. Perfect, thanks. All right, uh, Clint, street winter road maintenance. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. council. <clears throat> yeah, a fitting day to talk about bad weather, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for bringing that up. So there's not uh, a lot of changes uh, this year, but uh, always we use the feedback from each season to uh, incorporate into our snow plow, and, and there's a lot of always reoccurring themes. So uh, more plowing sooner, more equipment, people, and then uh, of course always completion of a full city plow with heavier snowfalls more quickly. So we've got that down to about three days. And then, of course, minimize driveway berms, uh, greater emphasis on plowing snow away from the sidewalks, and then focus on routes to schools, medical facilities, and, and more like that, which is how we prioritize. So when it snows, even if it's an inch or two, we uh, pull together all the utility crews when necessary, and we do what we call a maintenance plow, and that allows us Monday through Friday to be able to get into the residential areas as well as to uh, work the arterial streets at that time. And then when necessary to switch to a full city plow, we can always move into that as quickly as we need to and, and start our full city uh, snow plowing operations. Uh, driveway berms are always a topic that we hear about with uh, parking and sidewalks, but berms, we have lots of snow gates. We've uh, added one more last season, so we've got 19 of the snow gates, and uh, we're learning all the time each season. The guys get better and better with how to use them. They won't, will not completely eliminate a berm, but uh, they can sure reduce them drastically. And we also do use the gates, not just on driveways, but with ADA ramps, rapid corners, uh, trying to minimize the amount of snow that is left on those corners. And then, of course, the technique matters. We uh, 
really emphasize every year with our drivers to keep the snow off the sidewalks as much as possible. And uh, also the snow, uh, trying to find new areas to push the snow. So just because we've done something a certain way, we try to look at new opportunities to uh, improve the level of service. Uh, parking's always a, a good one. Uh, seasonal parking, uh, so we ask people to park on the odd side of the street. That does not mean you will not get a berm. What we're trying to do is just increase the uh, width of the street by parking on one side. You'll still get berms on both sides, but it does help the uh, emergency service vehicles mm -hmm. as well as, as our crews to be able to get through. And then uh, we ask that citizens move their RVs, boats, and trailers to winter storage. Uh, that's very helpful for us. And then downtown uh, parking is always a, a bit of a challenge that we have to work through. Sidewalks are another one that we get a lot of feedback on every season. And, and we do really try to uh, train the workers to keep the snow off the sidewalks. And it, no matter how careful you are, the snow at certain times is very difficult to keep out on the street. So we do have some ideas. Uh, we're trying to... Uh, uh, I guess engineer an idea that we can put on one of the blades to reduce the velocity of the snow so that we can get it to fall along the curb line. Some other entities have tried it and have had limited success, so it's something that we're going to be working on this season with our uh, mechanics to see what we can do with that. And then the last one is to uh, for the residents and businesses to clear their pathways to the uh, along their uh, businesses to help the pedestrians out and then uh, so this year you know we see trends of people still working at home a lot and uh, so that's more cars on the street making the uh, odd side parking more important than ever and uh, ag again uh, as you've heard we've had uh, some more new sites to store our de-icer and uh, salt so the crews can be able to uh, stay on the road more. They don't have to travel quite as far to, to go reload and, and to uh, renew that material. And then uh, again, more training. Uh, the training is ongoing with, especially with all the new people we get every season. And uh, to, we've got uh, places where you can find information in the uh, utility bills, uh, social media, and uh, city's website, and then of course our great folks at 311 are always very helpful to uh, direct people as necessary. In case you've never been in a piece of equipment, this is what it looks like from the seat. This, uh, you can see the snow along the van there. That's very challenging. On the left-hand side of the machine, they were also skirting some cars, so. And that's what it looked like just down the street a little bit. So, you know, that's, parking's always a challenge, and that's why any cooperation we can get from the residents really helps. Any questions? Just a personal anecdote. I, I've just noticed the last two years in particular, uh, Nevada, particularly between Francis and Garland, is just, relative to other streets, extra slick. Um, and I don't know if that's to do with like the asphalt that kind of melted off and, and kind of smoothed out that road a little bit, or if it's the abundance of shade that kind of covers parts of Nevada, but it does seem to be a lot worse than other streets. And so I don't, I don't know the reason, but, but just something to bring up if there's extra attention that can be shown to places like that, so. Okay, yeah, yeah that's good feedback. Yes, ma'am. Education, I did not know we had a maintenance plow one inch of snow. I thought two was the benchmark that no plows came out till there was two inches on the street. So this two one inch is interesting. Is, two inches is usually where it's at. I mean, if we wait till it gets to two, it's usually snowing more than that. So we, we try to work into that as we can. Okay. I wonder um, what discussions you guys have had about plowing over speed bumps and what kind of development there's been on that front. Well, there's a speed bump on the South Hill that we've... Uh, or speed table, uh, we've plowed over that, and that hasn't uh, drastically affected us. If it was a sharper incline, it might be a little bit more difficult, especially it depends upon the speeds. The speed limits on the roads could be pretty harsh if, if it was a speed 
bump instead of right, a right, table. Right. Yeah, or a speed hump. Inside yeah. Of a but the, like the one outside here on uh, Spokane Falls Boulevard, mm -hmm. as an example. Yeah, that that one's not not so serious that it affects us. Uh, we've had lots of conversations at traffic calming about neighborhoods wanting more speed humps, not the tables, bumps. Tables. Tables. Yeah. yeah. And they're neighborhoods, but a lot of pushback that we get from ICM is that streets can't and plows can't handle more of them. And so <clears throat> I was just kind of hearing you talk about that. It's kind of surprising to me. Well, that uh, used to be something that we, we thought. And uh, since they've went in to service, I don't know that we can really make that claim. That's helpful to know. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Richard Colton, uh, ARP SBO CHHS. Good afternoon. Uh, the city of Spokane received a little over $4.6 million in the home ARP uh, grant and the city council accepted that grant fund in October of 2021. Since then, the CHHS staff had spent several months in community engagement and drafting a plan uh, for HUD's acceptance. That plan was accepted in March of 2023. So we're seeking approval, a special budget ordinance to uh, award funds. Uh, we're currently working through the RFP now and entertaining applications. And we realized we needed to do an SBO for this fund. It is one-time funding separate from our annual home entitlement. So it requires an SBO. Okay. Any questions? Questions from anybody? Not seeing any? Okay. You get right. off easy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And lastly, Christine. Last but not least. Good afternoon, council members. Um, I'm coming to you because uh, SIRS board has uh, put forward and approved, and it has also been put in the 2024 budget, an increase to the employer and employee contribution rate from 10.75 to 11%. We actually haven't done one in two years. Last year we didn't present one. We held steady. Uh, the main reason for this increase this year was, of course, the market. And uh, the struggle that we continue to have is this recommendation was based on 2022 numbers and presented at our April board meeting and it won't go into effect till 2024. And so we continue to have this lag and we'll continue to work with um, finance and budget to see what we can do with that. But in the meantime, um, I'm coming to you because we have pro proposed this and the city has put it in place. Uh, the increase to the general fund is almost $275,000 um, overall. It, unfortunately, it's just over a million to all the departments, but general fund is about $275,000. Um, it does, uh, this, all the um, bargaining units have previously agreed that uh, the board can increase up to 1% annually without opening and renegotiating. Um, and so that has also helped the city with their credit rating, um, knowing that the city's doing what it can to do what needs to be done. Any questions? Yes, sir. I thought I heard you say 10.75, but I thought it was 10.25. Thank to, you, 10 yeah, and okay. a quarter up to 11, mm, yes. Okay. Thank you, my apologies. 0.75% increase. Any other questions? Chair Cathcart, we need a second sponsor. We have Councilmember Bingle currently. Okay. Anybody else jump in? Okay. All right. We'll we got it. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. Okay. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Hearing none, seeing none. Okay. We are adjourned and we'll be back at 3.30.